Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. In this podcast, Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I welcome back our colleague Steve Hayward, PRI Senior Fellow and a Senior Resident Scholar at UC Berkeley. We brought in Steve this week because April 22nd marks Earth Day. Growing up in the 70s, we marked Earth Day by planting a tree, cleaning up litter, or just enjoying nature by hiking, gardening, or going to the park. But in recent years, however, Earth Day has become an occasion for professional environmental activists and alarmists to warn of the impending apocalypse. We brought Steve back to set the record straight. He discusses the state of climate change, the Green New Deal, and a variety of energy issues. Thanks for joining us. Happy Earth Day, Steve, and to all of our listeners. So back in 1970, the first Earth Day was held as a day when people uh, would speak up in favor of well-meaning environmental reforms. You even saw Pat Nixon planting a tree on the White House lawn. Nearly 50 years later, the Earth Day movement has evolved into fighting capitalism and advocating that government dictate how we live our lives and and run our businesses, all in the name of the environment. Uh, What went wrong, Steve? How do we go from promoting conservation and better stewardship of natural resources to calling for the shutdown of entire industries and a massive redistribution of wealth? (laughs) Yeah, well, it actually happened pretty early on, unfortunately, uh, and it's when the left re realize they could use the environment as a stalking horse for you know central planning and, and essentially socialism. They didn't realize that right away. In fact, if you, you, know, you go back to that first Earth Day, and I was, what, in the sixth grade, I think. I remember it pretty well, oddly enough, um, because in those days, we actually did have you know, really high rates of air pollution, some really bad water pollution. And you know, a lot of things actually did need cleaning up. It, it didn't require upending the American economy or way of life to do it. It just meant uh, getting after it with some technological improvements and some sensible regulations. Of course, we never stopped with sensible ones. We did a lot of crazy ones, too. And nobody remembers this now, but the first Earth Day in 1970, you can go back and look at the contemporary press accounts, and you'll find the left was actually alarmed about it and against it. Uh, Some people on the left thought it was a Nixon plot to distract us from the anti-Vietnam War movement. A lot of them said that. A lot of people in the civil rights community said, what's this? This is just a distraction from civil rights and the the needs of uh, the inner cities. And so the left was actually calling, uh, many people on the left called for a boycott of Earth Day. Isn't that amazing to think about in retrospect? Um, And as you know, as people know who know the history of this, it was Richard Nixon who proposed creating the Environmental Protection Agency and actually was ahead of Congress in a lot of these things. So it didn't take too long, as I say, for the left to figure out that, hey, wait a minute, um, if we're gonna be controlling especially energy uh, and other you know, resource uh, uh, uses, that that was a way of, um, a backdoor way of uh, getting us to socialism. Steve, a lot of the discussion on environmental policy and climate change these days centers around doom and gloom. You know, we saw Al Gore famously say in 2006 that we only had a decade to save the planet from global warming. Well, we're still here 13 years later. So despite all of these, uh, you know, bad prognosticating, you know, we're still bombarded with doomsday scenarios that unless we cede all these powers to the government in the name of the environment, it's the end of planet Earth. Let's set aside some of this uh, hyperbole, and maybe you could share with our listeners, you know, just where do things stand with the environment on Earth Day 2019? Is, is there anything that gives you cause for alarm? Should I jump under the desk here? Uh, no, not, I mean, well, I mean... Uh, so here's the basic problem with environmentalists and with the environmental movement, which got so politicized early on, is that their their special gift, their superpower, is taking any practical problem and turning it into an end of the world apocalypse. And you know that's just a dumb way to do it because uh, uh, you know people uh, they they haven't heeded the old lesson of the, the moral fable of crying wolf too often. Uh, so uh, you know I think there are some genuine problems with uh, uh, oceans, which we don't know enough about. Uh, the state of oceanography is actually surprisingly primitive in many important ways, and uh, I think there's some problems with species habitat. None of those are end of the world problems. 
Uh, they're not going to you know, tip us over into catastrophe tomorrow or 10 years or 50 years from now. There are things to be looked at and studied and then uh, remedies proposed, incremental remedies. That's how you actually solve real problems in the world. Uh, and, but the environmentalists can't help it. They've got to say everything is potential end of the world. And by the way, I think that even applies to the big one that they really love and can't let go of, and that's climate change, which causes every problem in the world now, apparently. Uh, but, you know, um, you know the, um, a lot of the data coming in suggests that climate change is happening more slowly than, than even the alarmists expected just a few years ago. Uh, and so even if you believe in the worst case scenario, this idea that we only have 10 years to fix it, it's just sheer lunacy. Um, and, you know, you can go back to 1970 or even earlier than that. I, you can go back to the late 1940s when the first environmental voices like names forgotten now, like Fairfield Osborne, were saying, gosh, you know, the, the end of the planet is in sight within a generation or two. You know, that was 1948 he was writing that. Um, and in 1970, the UN had a report saying, you know, we're doomed by the year 2000 if we don't make huge changes. And yet here we are in 2019. And you know, the next generation of people come along like, uh, uh, you know, everybody's it girl, AOC, since she goes by her initials. And they say the same thing without realizing what fools they look at. And I think the public survey data shows that the public, while sympathizing with environmental concern, has come to apply a pretty steep discount to these crazy things that people say. Soon after he took office, President Trump moved to suspend or eliminate some of the Obama administration's big government environmental initiatives, such as the Paris Climate Accord and, and the so-called Clean Power Plan. The president also acted to increase America's energy independence. Naturally, there's been an uproar from liberals in Congress and in many European capitals. What's your view? Would these proposals have really done anything substantive to improve the environment? And isn't America a bit better off overall by by suspending them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so let's sort of take those things in order. You know, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, how many ways can you count how silly that thing is? Um, uh, one way of thinking about it is, uh, you know, the NAFTA treaty that's been such a matter of controversy, it's over a thousand pages long, and that's because there's lots of details in it. The Paris Accord is not even 40 pages long, which means there's no details in it at all. It's just a piece of mood music. And no less a climate alarmist than James Hansen, the former NASA chief climate scientist, had called the Paris Accord a fraud. Now, here's the funny thing. Since the Paris Accord was signed, what, four years ago now, the rate of decarbonization by European countries and actually the whole world has declined. You know, if the Paris Accord was really going to do something, it would have been the other way around. And so uh, I like to say to environmentalists that uh, you ought to applaud Trump for some honesty. And I like to say, uh, uh, you know, ExxonMobil and some of the oil companies said we ought to stay in the Paris Accord. And <laughs> James Hansen said it was a fraud. And I said, it's funny that you guys are taking the side of ExxonMobil against one of the chief climate scientists in the world. I have a lot of fun with that. The so-called clean power plan was really an attempt to nationalize the nation's electricity grids, which have been run either regionally or on the state level since you know more than a century ago, and it would not have done very much to reduce emissions. And you know, I read the whole thousand-page regulatory impact analysis, and they kind of admitted that it would make only a marginal difference in the trajectory of emissions trends, which have been going down because natural gas has gotten so cheap that it's now outcompeting coal in the marketplace. Uh, so, uh, and it was also under a legal challenge. I mean, I think there was a good chance the Supreme Court, when it finally got the case, was going to strike down the plan on some statutory grounds. I think it doesn't quite conform with the Clean Air Act that they were trying to base it on. So that's a technical legal question. Uh, here's a little, um, a little tidbit most people don't know. You know, back in 2009, uh, Obama and Congress tried to pass the Waxman-Markey Emissions Trading um, Bill, and it didn't pass the Senate. But what's important is uh, it had in it a 2020 interim target for emissions reductions for the United States. Well, guess what? We have actually made those emissions reduction targets without the Waxman-Markey bill, without the Clean Power Plan going into effect. Why did that happen? Well, I just gave you the reason. It's because our natural gas boom has reduced the price of natural gas by 80% from 15 years ago. And improvements in natural gas turbine technology has means it's now the cheapest you know, a source of electricity that we uh, uh, can, um, uh, that we have. And so a lot of utilities had said, we're going to switch to natural gas and get out of coal because they have these old coal plants that are expensive to upgrade and maintain. 
And the point is the marketplace did that, not government regulation, although you can bet that if we passed the Waxman-Markey bill, uh, Congress and the politicians would be claiming credit for the trends that owe entirely to the marketplace and to technological changes that no one saw coming. So our new friend, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, has generated significant attention this year in a lot of ways, but specifically for the Green New Deal. Now, our listeners may have heard a lot of noise about her plan, but they don't really know what's in it. And if you listen to her, she may not really know what's in it either. So <laughs> what would we have in store for us if AOC got her way with the Green New Deal? And what would it mean for the economy? Well, I mean, it's almost impossible to say because there are so few details. I mean, um, I, I think what's most revealing about the Green New Deal is that how little of it is actually to do with energy. Uh, the key parts of the Green New Deal are health care for everybody a guaranteed job for everybody, free college, uh, housing. In other words, uh, it really is this sort of grand socialist sentiment that we're going to fix all problems all at once because everything's connected to everything else. And, uh, you know, even if you are an extreme climate alarmist, uh, this is a technological problem. And, you know, it behooved them to sort of, uh, you know, to concentrate on that and instead of saying we're going to solve all problems at once. And so, yeah, I mean, I think if any of the Green New Deal actually came to a vote, well, actually, you know, Mitch McConnell brought the resolution to a vote in the Senate and the Democrats all voted present because even they are embarrassed by this outline of a non-plan. So I don't know. I keep thinking that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is maybe uh, Karl Rove's greatest dirty trick on the Democrats yet because <laughs> she really is so crazy. And another thing uh, to stray a little bit from the environmental point I am absolutely convinced that House Democrats, the ones who've been there five, 10 terms in the House, you know, 10 or 20 years, really can't stand her. Uh, why? Because if you're a Democrat who has been in the minority for the last decade and you've been paying your dues, you've been working your way up in your committees, you've been learning some issues, and she comes along and suddenly she gets all the press. She's in the media constantly, she's getting all the speaking invitations around the country. And I guarantee you that uh, politicians have healthy egos, and they're not happy about this youngster coming along and generating all this attention. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if a lot of Democrats wouldn't be sorry to see her defeated in an upcoming election. Well, you know, um, speaking of AOC again and the Green New Deal, um, proponents talk about how the plan will help the poor and, and reduce economic inequality. Uh, uh, PRI's Wayne Weingarten documented in his study, Legislating Energy Poverty, 100% renewable energy mandates and other big government policies increase energy burdens. This is, of course, felt disproportionately by poor, rural, inland, and, and minority communities in, in the state. So what's it going to take for America's liberal elites to realize that policies like the Green New Deal hurt the working class uh, in most areas? Well, I think what it takes is losing a few more elections, uh, which unfortunately is hard for them to do in California because the state's gotten so lopsided. But I think it's interesting to look around the world. Um, it's not getting a lot of press right now, but the protests in France that started last, uh, what, November or December, initially over higher uh, fuel taxes, they're still going on every weekend. There's still riots and thousands of people taking the streets throughout France every weekend. It's now, in a typical French way, broadened into all kinds of other things, apparently. It's hard to tell about France. Um, but that's not the only example uh, you see in Germany, in Denmark, a lot of other European countries where uh, energy prices have soared. Uh, and, you know, you actually have statistics now on the number of people who are getting ill or even dying of the cold because they can't afford to heat their homes in the winter because it's cold over in Europe in the winter. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea that we're going to solve our problems by making energy unaffordable, uh, that's going to reach its limits pretty fast. We're lucky in this country that in most of the country, not California, sadly, but in most of the country, energy is still quite affordable. Uh, but that could change in a hurry uh, if you get some maniacs in charge of things. So a lot of the talk behind the Green New Deal is on subsidies for electric cars or zero emission vehicles. And as Wayne Weingarten, PRI's busiest man, noted in his uh, studies, costly subsidy for the rich, 
You know, 99% of electric car subsidies are going to households making more than $50,000 per year. So it seems like only big corporations like the Teslas of the world and the wealthy are the ones that are really benefiting from these types of policies. I mean, isn't this the type of crony capitalism and giveaways to the rich that AOC and her allies frequently decry? Oh my goodness! It it the hypocrisy of this is just stunning because you you're right. You complain about tax breaks to the rich, uh, but beyond just that uh, embarrassment of the whole thing, is what's the actual environmental uh, benefit of moving to electric cars? And it turns out it's not that large. In fact, it could even be negative depending on where you live in the country. Now here in California, we don't have any coal-fired power, although we may get a little bit from out of state now and then. I mean, about half our electricity, I think, is from natural gas. And what that means is you have a natural gas-powered car if you drive a Tesla. Now, if you live in Indiana or Ohio, uh, I looked at the numbers a couple of years ago on this, where 80 to 90 percent of their electricity is supplied by coal, that means you should drive a Tesla, you're driving a coal-powered car. And there have been some life cycle analyses done that suggest that the overall environmental impact, including the carbon in, uh, uh, footprint, of a Tesla in a place like Ohio and Indiana may be higher than if you drove a gasoline-powered car. And that leaves aside uh, the whole environmental impact of the batteries that we have to have in very large amounts for whether it's electric cars or the power, the Tesla Powerwall for a house. And guess what? It turns out that the supply chain for the lithium we need for lithium-ion batteries is enormous. Uh, the carbon footprint of that supply chain in manufacturing and eventual disposal and recycle is also very large. Uh, and so, you know, people think, gosh, I'm driving a zero emission car. I mean, I'll see Teslas with stickers saying, gee, aren't I neat? I'm driving a zero emission car. That turns out to be completely wrong if you think about it uh, in the correct way, uh, you know, entire product life cycle. But that's where we are. People love to feel uh, good about themselves. Driving an electric car is a uh, pure virtue signaling. Uh, and by the way, the fact that you have to bribe even rich people with a big tax credit shows you that there's still a lot of market resistance to driving them. So they say as California goes, so goes the, the nation. Not surprisingly, a lot of the bad ideas in the Green New Deal were first enacted in our state, such as targeting <laughs> farting cows and, and getting rid of airplanes. Thanks to renewable energy mandates, electricity and prices in California rose three times higher than in the rest of the U.S. between 2016 and 2017. We now have the highest average electricity prices in the continental U.S. Wouldn't the rest of America have have the same fate in store under the Green New Deal? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you know, as we're talking right now, uh, there's a brand new study just out from, I forget the name of it, it's an energy research institute at the University of Chicago that's very good. Uh, I, I'm trying to find it here on my computer. Well, I can't lay my hands on it quickly. But uh, what it says is, is that uh, using wind and solar power is the most expensive way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. <laughs> and that's where, in, in other words, they're saying if you spread the California model throughout the rest of the country, you're going to get the same result, which is much higher electricity prices. Now, one of the things that's about that we're going to learn about in California over the next decade, I think, is this: we are closing down our last nuclear power plant, Diablo Canyon, in about three, four years, when its initial licensing period runs out. It was, by the way, one of the last nuclear power plants built before we quit doing that 40 years ago, and so. It's easily um, uh, eligible to be relicensed for another 20 years at least uh, because it's in fine shape. And it currently produces more electricity than all of California's wind and solar power combined. So now you stop for a minute and realize that to stay even with uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, we will have to double the current amount uh, at least of wind and solar power to make up for the amount of power generation we're going to lose by closing down Diablo Canyon. Now, why are we closing it down? Well, that's because the renewable energy mandates are for just that, renewable energy, but not non-carbon energy. And so nuclear power doesn't count for PG&E's portfolio. And so they're actually being forced to close down uh, a non-carbon emitting major stationary source of power to satisfy this mindless mandate for just essentially wind and solar power. Uh, so what's going to happen is, is California's greenhouse gas emissions have been declining. They've kind of flattened out lately. 
and they're going to probably go back up again because we're going to end up swapping out some natural gas to replace the Diablo Canyon. The utility denies this, but they're lying about it. Uh, of course, I'm kind of delighted the PG&E has gone bankrupt. I got, that's about got a bottle of champagne out when they did because they deserve it when they lie to us about things like this. And then one other thing that's fun to notice is that we're building a lot more solar power. And yeah, it's gotten cheap to generate solar power when the sun is shining. And right now we're generating so much surplus solar power during the daytime on many days that we're giving the power away to other states and sometimes even paying them to take it from us. Uh, and you know this makes utterly no sense at all. And over time, we're gonna find this whole model is unsustainable to use the word that the environmentalists like to use. So another only in California idea that AOC and her allies are promoting is high speed rail. In your view, why are so many from Jerry Brown to AOC so insistent upon building high-speed rail, often at huge taxpayer costs and minimal environmentalists? And what would the rest of the country see if AOC succeeds in banning airplanes and switching to a national high-speed rail network? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I laugh at every single one of these questions, not because they're dumb questions, but because they're, you know, I, I, they're hard to take seriously when people say things as ridiculous as this. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, one of the only good things our new governor, Gavin Newsom, did was pull the plug on the high-speed rail from, what, L.A. to San Francisco, although he backtracked a little and said, I guess we'll finish that part in the, in the San Joaquin Valley where between two places where nobody lives. Uh, look, this is, uh, I don't understand this fascination either. I think part of it is Europe envy. Remember, if you're on the left, you envy Europe for its high taxes, its high welfare state, and their high-speed rail. The thing that uh, people overlook is that the, the high-speed rail trains in Europe, they are heavily subsidized, but they're also, they're going a much shorter distances. In other words, you know, France is what, smaller than Texas? Uh, and so, you know, high-speed rail can get you around there, although I'll bet the number of people who use it, it's actually comparatively small. Uh, but the United States is a much bigger place, and the idea that high-speed rail from, say, Chicago to Dallas is a substitute for an airplane trip for, you know, business people is ludicrous, let alone, you know, New York to Los Angeles or any other place in between. Uh, so, you know, even 200 mile an hour rail, it would still take you, what, you know, several days to get across the country. That's just not going to work. Never mind how expensive it would be and the cost would be astronomical. Uh, so I don't know what planet they're living on. I sometimes think that uh, like light rail for cities, there's a fixation with uh, liberals and wanting to plan where we are, right? If we're on a train, they know where we're going. They know how fast we're going and they control our destinations. The reason they hate automobiles is they're, you know, the totems of freedom. We can get in our car anytime we want and go any place we want, and they don't have any way to control us. Oh, and by the way, if we're in our cars, we're probably listening to Rush Limbaugh instead of reading a liberal newspaper like we might be on a train. <laughs> so I think there's cultural reasons as well as, uh, you know, other goofy reasons of, you know, it's just an amazing thing that we want to have a 19th century technology for 21st century mobility needs. It may be an inconvenient truth, but fossil fuels like natural gas keep energy affordable for the middle class. In fact, the average American family saved more than $1,300 in 2015 on energy bills thanks to natural gas. Shouldn't our focus be on an all-above-the approach to energy rather than doubling down on the most expensive and least reliable forms? Uh, well, you know, that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> the, uh, the, the problem is, uh, well, I mean, you know, to repeat myself, is there's this impulse uh, amongst, uh, you know, the liberal and, and socialist mindset to want to control and change everything they think is wrong with the world. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know, you, you made a good point about natural gas is that uh, the natural gas revolution of the last 15 years is something that happened completely out of sight of the politicians. In fact, you know, I like to say, and I think this is true, that if Washington, D.C. had gotten any hint that the fracking revolution was beginning back around 2003, 2004, they would have done everything in their power to stop it. And, of course, environmentalists now do want to stop it. Uh, and, you know, the price of natural gas came went down from, I think, 14 or $15 a thousand cubic feet to about $3 today. Hard to imagine another basic product. And that's why households have saved so much money, as you mentioned, uh, both in electricity rates going down and in direct natural gas prices going down for people who heat their homes with natural gas. So it's been a great boom. Uh, and then on the back of all that, people figured out that, gosh, 
not only can we produce more natural gas with this new technology, we can produce more oil too. So you remember the you know, liberals all saying as recently as 10 years ago, uh, President Obama himself said it, that we can't drill our way out of our declining oil production. Well, guess what? We did. We're, we've almost doubled our domestic oil production, uh, almost all of it on private land, some of it on old federal leases, uh, and liberals hate it, right? This should be one of the great success stories of the last 10 years in America, and liberals can't stand it. Uh, because it goes against their orthodoxy about fossil fuels and climate and all the rest. Uh, I think that uh, those energy technologies for oil and gas uh, are going to continue to improve. And I think you'll see the, the consumption end also improve. I think we're making a lot of progress in more efficient power plants, whether it's coal or gas. Uh, and I think automobile technology is going to continue to get better uh, in a variety of ways. And you know, I'm actually kind of bullish on hybrid cars uh, of a certain kind that I think makes some sense. But remember, those aren't really a solution for the whole world because, you know, if you're a climate alarmist, uh, all of those are expensive technologies that right now only rich countries can afford, which is why all this um, attention given to California or even our own country is really something of a sideshow. Well, finally, you know, the focus of environmental policy always seems to be on government dictating people's behavior or politicians imposing a new tax or creating a new program. And as Wayne Weingarten found in his research, states that have rejected what you could call the California New York Energy Agenda, sounds like a good movie title there, <laughs> they are actually doing a more effective job than California, Newark, and uh, other uh, like-minded states are doing in reducing emissions. So what are states like Ohio and West Virginia doing right that we can learn from? And what are some free market reforms that policymakers should consider in setting their environmental approach? Yeah, so uh, I, you know, I don't know as I don't know. Uh, I haven't kept up with what the Midwestern states like Ohio and Indiana are doing necessarily. I think the state that's fun to look at because it drives the liberals out of their minds is actually Texas. <laughs> so, you know, it turns out that Texas is the number one wind power state in the country. Now, they didn't they didn't do a mandate the way California did. Instead of saying we want 20 percent or 50 percent or whatever percentage numbers a lot of states have done, they decided, uh, I think, all the way back when George W. Bush was governor 20 years ago, that they wanted to uh, increase the amount of wind power, and they named a megawatt target that they wanted to hit of capacity. Part of that was for diversification's sake, but along with it, they modernized their grid. And that's what a lot of states are not doing, including California, is they added a lot of grid capacity. Uh, and then they, uh, they deregulated their markets in the right place. In other words, they allowed a lot more open access to the new grid and the upgraded grid. And so you really have a genuine, more open market for energy in Texas. And so at the same time, Texas has become, you know, maybe the leading oil output um, place in the world. The Permian Basin is just booming right now. Uh, it's also been the innovator in how you deregulate and restructure electricity markets the best. Uh, and so I, I haven't looked at their greenhouse numbers lately, but I'll bet they look pretty good. And you can't mention Texas <laughs> to liberals because they hate Texas, right? Uh, but, you, uh, but Texas is different uh, from the rest of the country because it's so big because it's always had energy literate people. And also something most people don't know is it has its own energy grid that's just in the state of Texas. You know, the rest of the country, California, uh, you know, Ohio and Indiana, they're all part of multi-state grids. And that has made states trying to reform their own electricity uh, sectors a little more difficult because they're limited in what they can do all by themselves without the cooperation of other states. And so Texas is blessed by being able to go it alone and they've shown us the best model yet. Great interview. Thanks so much, Steve. Sure thing. It was fun. Special thanks to Steve Hayward and Tim and Aya. To do a deep dive on energy and environmental issues, go to PRI's website at pacificresearch.org. Now, if you're working on your vacation plans, don't forget to consider mixing policy and cruising. Join PRI and the Claremont Institute for our joint 40th anniversary cruise on the Mediterranean. The cruise starts in Barcelona and ends in Rome with a special tour of the Vatican. Special guests include Andrew Roberts, author of Churchill, Walking with Destiny, and will include our own Steve Hayward and Sally Pipes. 
For more details, visit ci-pri.com. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.